When the French Revolution broke out, due to the anger of the population against the King Louis XVI and his Queen Marie Antoinette, no one would have believed that shortly the monarchy would be abolished and the King and Queen would make their ways to the guillotine for their executions. What came after was a brutal period of time, known as the Terror, in which the device of death or the nation's razor, as it was known, would fall upon the necks of thousands of people across France. King Louis and his wife were out of touch and were seen as symbols of ridicule as they would spend huge sums of money which could have been used to help the French people who were starving as prices rose and people suffered. But eventually the people would sentence their king and queen to death and they were both executed on the same guillotine. But they were also buried near to each other in the same cemetery and decades later the coffins and graves of the king and queen were broken into and they would be exhumed with the bones dug up of Marie Antoinette and Louis XVI. This is a story of that exhumation and opening the coffins of the executed king and queen of France. As always, to support our channel, please make sure to subscribe. The French king was formally arrested on the 13th of August 1792, and his ordeal was rough as he was imprisoned inside of the temple, an ancient prison in Paris. He was forced to abdicate and was deposed, and he was simply known as Louis Capet, and a king no more. The king was then brought to trial, and he would be paraded throughout the crowded streets, but the people were shocked what was happening, as the king was brought in front of the National Convention to hear that he had been accused of high treason. Louis XVI was also accused of a large number of crimes against the state, and he tried to defend himself as best as he could, but he knew that he would be found guilty. He could have been exiled and sent to different countries and lands, but he was sentenced to death. In January 1793, the 38-year-old King Louis XVI was taken from his prison to the guillotine inside the Place de la Revolution in Paris. The guillotine was actually brought into commission by Louis himself, and it had been suggested that he even suggested using a slanted blade rather than a curved blade which had been put forward. But he would never have believed that this would take his life. The device would take the heads of thousands following the king's execution in what was known as a reign of terror, but the king's execution began the bloodshed. Louis XVI tried to make a short speech on the scaffold, but was drowned out by the sound of guards and drumming, and he claimed he was innocent of any crime. The executioner then grabbed the king and placed him on the wooden board before he was slid under the guillotine blade, and after a few final checks the blade was released. It was claimed that the blade did not sever the king's neck as cleanly as it could have, as it may have gone straight through his mouth, and that the king allegedly let out a huge scream when the blade came down. But the executioner claimed that the king went to his death with bravery and decorum. But then following Louis's execution, the king's head was displayed quickly to the crowd, and the remains were then placed inside of a wooden coffin, and were put back on a cart and transported to the nearby Madeleine Cemetery. The remains of those men and women who were executed at the Place de la Revolution were buried here as it was close by, and the king's remains were purposely thrown into an unmarked grave, and his head was placed between his feet in an act of disgrace, and quick lime was thrown over his body to allow it to decompose quicker, almost in an attempt to erase his rule and life from the face of this earth. The revolutionaries clearly wanted their former king gone, but he would then be exhumed and dug up years later. Many people knew where the king had been buried, and it was no great secret, as maps had even been drawn up of the Madeleine Cemetery, and people came to visit the king's grave and to pay their respects. Some staff of the graveyard even gave tours to tourists and foreign dignitaries, but in May 1814, it was looked into the possibility of having King Louis XVI and his wife Marie Antoinette exhumed, then interred inside of a proper burial site fit for a king and queen. The exhumations began on the 18th of January, 1815, and they were performed by many ministers and experts, and the Queen's body was found first and identified by some of her clothing. But then the following day, Louis's remains were found. The search for him had begun on the first day, and they resumed after night fell the next morning. The authorities had dug a deep trench near to a wall, but the workers found quicklime sediment that had mixed with the earth, and also a number of bits of board from the coffin of Louis. They then came across the broken skeletal remains of a man who had his body covered in quicklime and a skull 
which was found placed between his leg bones. No clothing was found on the remains that could have helped to identify these bones, but everyone was convinced that this was the king. This is due to the location of the burial and the documented sites of the burial made decades before. The remains of Louis XVI were then placed in a chest and then inside a lead coffin, ready for reburial. One witness said that, on the 20th of January we proceeded, in pursuance of the king's commands, to the house of M. Desclasseau, where we the commissioners had been present at the preceding operations together with other personages, whose right of office or the king's commands had assembled, witness the removal of the remains of their majesties into leaden coffins made for that purpose. In the presence of these noble and other personages, we broke the seals and opened the chest in which the remains had been deposited. Those of his majesty were placed in a leaden coffin, together with pieces of lime and wood, and were then soldered down. Upon the lid was fastened a gold plate, with the following inscription, and excuse my French, Ici est le corps du tres haut, très puissant, et très excellent, Prince Louis the Sixteenth. There were some who have claimed that the bones may have been not Louis the Sixteenth that were found, and no official identification occurred, but it was accepted generally that these were correct. It was found in the right recorded spot, and was found buried twelve feet down, and was covered in lime. The search also took a lot longer than that of Marie Antoinette's. There was a lot less of the king to find than the queen. It was clear that this person in the grave had lost their head on the guillotine, but the remains were in a bad way compared to Marie's. Further searches took place to find nearby burials, but there were none nearby that could have been confused as the king. It was said of the exhumation by a witnessing Frenchman that the tomb of Louis the Sixteenth was placed here on the 21st of January 1793 at half past ten in the morning. A pit of eight feet depth was dug and a great deal of quicklime placed in it. The body of the king was placed in a wooden coffin with quicklime on top. On the 16th of October 1793, the body of his queen, his wife, was buried near to him with a similar quantity of quicklime. The coffin of Louis XVI, after around two decades, had been broken into, and his remains were then planned to have been buried inside of the Basilica of Saint-Denis, and specifically inside of the royal mausoleum befitting their status as kings and queens of France. There was a large reburial ceremony that occurred, and it was said of this that, a detachment of artillery joined the procession at the barrier Saint-Denis, and followed it firing minute guns. A regiment of the king's chasseurs lined the road from Paris to Saint-Denis, the drums and musical instruments were covered with black serge, and the arms and colours of the troops were ornamented with crepe. A deep and solemn silence prevailed among the multitudes who thronged the streets and road by which the procession passed. Upon reaching the church of Saint-Denis, the bodies were taken from the car by the guards de la Manche and carried into the church, where they were received by the clergy and presented by the bishop of Carcasson to the bishop of Air. They were then placed upon a lofty tomb of state in the midst of the choir. When all these attendants had taken their places, the service commenced. The princes and princesses followed by their grand master, the master of ceremonies and their assistants approached the altar to present their offerings, after which a funeral oration was delivered by the Bishop of Troy. The absolution having been pronounced, the bodies were lowered into the royal vault, into which Monsignor and the two princes, his sons, descended, and prostrated themselves upon the coffins of their royal relatives. Salutes of artillery were fired at the moment when the procession set out from Paris, during the service of Saint-Denis, and when the bodies were lowered into the vault. To perpetuate the memory of these august victims, the king has ordained that solemn funeral services shall be performed annually, in all churches of the kingdom, on the 21st of January, for the repose of the soul of Louis XVI, and on the 16th of October for that of his royal consort, that on those days the court shall wear mourning, and the public offices, courts of justice, exchange and theatres should be closed. The reburial of King Louis XVI was a huge event, and many of the members of the nobility were there to witness this. But he is remembered in history as a king who had a blatant disregard for the feelings of his people, and he was a monarch who should have been more in touch with what was happening inside of his lands. If the king had tried to help the plight of the French back in the 1790s, then there could very well have been still a monarchy in France today. But following his execution, his remains were dug up and exhumed.
Marie Antoinette was brought by the National Convention of France to a tribunal on the 14th of October 1793, which was accused of many shocking and brutal charges. The courtroom was a farce, and it was decided already that she would die, and many people thought that the verdict was already predetermined. Her lawyers were not allowed to prepare a sufficient defence for her, such was the haste, as the former queen was taken from her prison cell, and she was accused of some of the most serious crimes. These even included incest, as her own son had been turned against her, and accused her of this shocking charge, but Marie was accused of also depleting the national treasury, and handing over a lot of money to Austria, her homeland, which was also said to have been involved in plotting large-scale massacres. It was a short trial, and two days later on the 16th of October she would be found guilty of three major charges, which were high treason against the French people, depleting the national treasury to a huge extent, negatively affecting the finances of the French, and also conspiracy against the security of the state, linked to foreign powers declaring war on the nation. But Marie's lawyers, despite this, were shocked that she would be sentenced to death, and they thought she would be handed back over to the Austrians and barred from ever coming back to France. But when the death sentence was passed, there was an audible gasp in the courtroom. But to prepare her for her execution, Marie was then sent back briefly to her prison, which was regarded as the antechamber to the guillotine, which would later then be summoned to go to her death. To prepare Marie Antoinette, the former queen, had her hair roughly cut short, to make sure when the guillotine blade fell that her hair did not snag in the blade, and to allow a cut straight through her neck. Also, she was forced to undress in front of her guards and wear a white dress to her execution, despite the fact she wanted to wear black, almost as if she was in mourning for herself and for France. But the cart then arrived to pick her up, and the guards attached a lead to her neck, as if they were walking a dog, and then the cart, containing the former queen and her priest and confidant, then processed slowly throughout the streets of Paris. Its final destination was the Place de la Revolution, and the same guillotine and execution site, where Marie's husband would lose his head months before. The people of Paris could not believe what they were seeing, the former queen on the back of the cart, slowly moving to her death in the procession of the dead, and many shouted abuse and jeered at her, and some also threw objects towards the queen. But those who saw her would note how she seemed solemn and almost in a trance, and it's believed that she would welcome her execution, as she had a very rough few months, and she knew that her end was coming. She would not speak to the priest with her, and just remained in quiet. But at 12.15pm, the Queen of France got to the scaffold, which was helped out of the cart, and was then taken up the stairs of the scaffold where the guillotine stood on top of. Her final words were recorded as, Pardon me, sir, I did not do it on purpose, as she stood on the foot of the executioner when she was making her way up onto the guillotine. Certainly this was not the iconic word she would have hoped to be remembered for. But then the executioner, who was very experienced, placed a wooden board in front of Marie, and she was then secured to it, before the former Queen of France was lowered onto the guillotine, and was then slid under the sharp slanted blade. This was an execution device advocated by her own husband, and it's believed that Louis XVI decided upon using the slanted blade rather than the crescent one, and he passed a law that saw this efficient device being used in his kingdom. But it would take the head off his wife and him. The executioner made the final checks, and then with a push of the lever, the blade fell and directly sliced through Marie's neck, and her head was taken off in one swift and sharp blow. The executioner then picked up Marie Antoinette's head, and some images even show him parading it above the crowd on a pike. But following the execution, the former queen's remains were collected up, and they were then placed inside of a coffin. Her head was also kept with her, and she was then taken to the Madeleine Cemetery nearby, and the convention ordered that she, like her husband, should be buried in an unmarked grave, with nothing that highlighted her importance. Madame Tussaud would take a death mask off her face during a break whilst the gravediggers were talking and having lunch, and this would then be later used to create waxwork heads of the executed queen. Madame Tussaud would do this to stand the right side of the revolutionaries. However, in the decades following her execution, there was a slight restoration of the monarchy, but many people knew where Marie was buried. There were maps drawn up of the rough spot, and also locals gave tours to tourists and foreign dignitaries who wanted to pay their respects to the executed king and queen of France. But in 1814, King Louis XVIII ordered an investigation into where the remains were, 
and also what the possibility was of Marie Antoinette's remains being dug up, then reinterred in the Royal Mausoleum, inside the Basilica of Saint-Denis. Marie Antoinette's remains were found around the 18th of January 1815, and her husband's were found shortly after. When the gravediggers broke the soil in the Madeleine Cemetery, they found the right spot, and they found the coffin of Marie, and they discovered that a layer of quicklime had been thrown on top of the coffin, to dissolve her remains quicker, but this had solidified and had not worked properly, meaning the former Queen of France's remains were preserved well, compared to others. On her remains they found the stockings, that she had been forced to wear in prison, and these confirmed her identity, as they were the same ones as other prisoners were given, in the prison, and the discovery also said that the woman had lost her head at the foot of a sharp instrument that performed the very sharp and clean cut as a guillotine would. On the skull of the Queen, which had been found at her feet in an act of disgrace, was also some hair that remained on her head. But after this, the people who made the discovery would place the remains of the former Queen and any other goods found in the coffin inside of two chests and then preparations began to bury her in a royal burial site. Around the grave, there were people who were crying, and were praying heavily, and some even fainted, as Marie Antoinette's bones were dug up. Then a huge ceremony took place to inter King Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette inside the Basilica of Saint-Denis. In this, there was a lot of pomp and ceremony, including musicians, who would play as the bones were lowered into the tomb. Still today, the remains of King Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette are laid to rest where they were reburied, and they remain controversial figures. In the last few decades, many historians have took a more sympathetic approach to the life of Marie Antoinette, and her execution was one which was considered more of a propaganda victory for the revolutionaries than one of grand importance. Marie was at the time a defeated woman, who had witnessed her husband butchered and her children treated terribly, that she should probably have been sent to Austria, or been forced to live in exile with the rest of the royal family. But her execution had a profound effect on monarchs all around Europe, as these kings and queens began to fear rebellion in their own lands. Thanks for watching. To support our channel, please make sure to subscribe, and once again, thank you so much for watching.